That night was one of the most frightening of my life. Viv and I manage our farm in the countryside, a peaceful and isolated place we considered our sanctuary. But on that dark night, an unwelcome visitor appeared to test our courage. It all started with strange noises around the house, sounds of heavy footsteps, growls, and a scent in the air. Viviane and I were having dinner when we first heard these sounds. Initially, we thought it was a wild animal, perhaps a wolf, but something told us it was something worse. I went to the window and could barely believe what I saw. Under the dim moonlight, I spotted a large, hairy figure moving among the shadows. Its physique suggested supernatural strength. I had no doubt, it was a werewolf, a creature I never imagined seeing, even while living on a farm. When Vivian saw it, her expression of terror confirmed my suspicions. We stayed very quiet, and after some time, the creature left without trying to enter the house. We couldn't ignore it. The next day, we decided to act before the creature returned. We grabbed as many boards as we could find and started reinforcing our doors and windows. It was a race against time before the next night. Every nail hammered was an effort to ensure our safety and that of our home. When we finished, it felt like we had an improvised fortress. We were exhausted, but now safer. The following night we waited for it to return. We were in the same spot in front of the wood stove when we heard a terrifying howl. Shortly after hearing the howl, the werewolf was back at our farm. Our hearts raced, but we remained steadfast. The creature began to circle the house, trying to find a way in. It scratched its prey at some parts of the doors and windows, but now it would be at least three times harder for the creature to get in. The night dragged on, each moment feeling like an eternity of fear and tension. But to our relief, the boards proved to be our salvation. The werewolf, after several failed attempts, left again, disappearing into the darkness of the night. Viviane and I hugged each other, relieved and grateful that we had stood firm. Our house was intact, although it was surrounded by all that wood. We left the boards there for a while, and after a few weeks, after confirming that the creature would not return, we removed the boards. Since then, we've been armed, but we haven't seen the werewolf again. We told this story to the neighbors and local authorities, but many still don't believe it and think it was just an urban legend. Many of our neighbors don't have weapons inside their homes. Viviane and I are prepared in case the creature ever returns. Good night. That night started like so many others we had spent together, Veronica and I. In our quest for adventure and moments of relaxation, we decided to camp in a secluded clearing surrounded by trees and a nearby stream. Bottles of wine, laughter echoing through the night as we celebrated our bond and the freedom that nature offered. Laughter and toasts mixed together our hearts carefree amidst nature. Suddenly, we began to hear strange sounds, branches breaking in the forest. At first, we thought it might be wild animals or even our imagination fueled by alcohol. But as the night progressed and the wine bottles emptied, the sounds became more frequent and distinct. Veronica and I exchanged glances with a slight concern but our drunken courage still kept us optimistic and somewhat unaware. 
That's when we started hearing human voices, or at least they sounded like it. Restless whispers, as if someone were watching us, playing with us. Our initial reaction was nervous laughter, attributing the voices to possible locals trying to scare us, or even some psychological effect of the alcohol and the darkness. Veronica, with her fearless nature, suggested we investigate, claiming we wouldn't let any ghost or local legend ruin our fun. We laughed together, ignoring the growing sense of unease creeping into our minds. Armed only with flashlights and courage, we ventured to the edge of the forest, making our laughter and banter an attempt to convince whoever was trying to scare us that it wasn't working. We made disconnected comments, the alcohol still warming our bodies, but something around us began to chill our minds. Something was moving among the trees, our flashlights capturing silhouettes we couldn't discern. Must be some local ritual, a tasteless prank, I exclaimed, trying to convince myself it was nothing serious. That's when we saw the creature for the first time just briefly among the tree shadows. It seemed like a distorted figure, but one that walked upright. My heart felt like it wanted to burst out of my chest. We ran back to the campsite, our steps clumsy and hurried, wanting to save ourselves from something unknown. The voices pursued us, mimicking our own gasping breaths. They were getting closer and more real with each passing moment. Back in the clearing, illuminated by the firelight, we tried to spot any sign of the thing, but the clearing was empty. That's when we couldn't believe it. We heard Veronica's voice echoing through the forest, but she was right beside me. Our hearts froze as we looked at each other, hearing her voice saying nonsensical things through the woods. Paralyzed by terror, she only screamed, It's not me. Whatever that was, it was closing in on us. We had no idea what was happening. How could people trying to scare us mimic Veronica's voice? If it came through the forest, we would be easy prey. Our only option was to get into the tent and hold knives in case something tried to enter. However, nothing did. Something just seemed to be circling our campsite, emitting those sounds that seemed to come straight from hell. Until finally, all of that vanished with the darkness of the night giving way to dawn. In the first rays of sunlight, we got out of there as quickly as possible, leaving many of our things behind. I have no idea what that was, but knowing some legends, I strongly suspect it was a demon. Good night. My name is Julio, and I'm going to tell you what happened to me on a certain night in the year 2001. At that time, I was 28 years old. It was night, and I was at home, enjoying a rare moment of peace after an exhausting day of work. However, the calm was suddenly interrupted by sinister howls echoing through the dense forest surrounding my house. Nowadays, that place no longer exists. The forest has been turned into a neighborhood, with paved streets and blocks with all the houses built. But back then, it was more like a rural area. I started to get intrigued, trying to understand what those howls were. It was as if I knew what was about to happen, curious and at the same time apprehensive. 
I approached the window, the howls getting closer and closer, the darkness of the night becoming the darkest I had ever experienced, while the howls continued to fill the air, indicating that something was about to happen. That was when I saw a very large and black figure outside, illuminated by the faint light of the moon. It was a werewolf. Its presence was imposing, and an ordinary person, even armed, wouldn't dare to face it. My eyes widened in horror at the sight, and for a moment I could hardly believe what was coming. The werewolf advanced toward my house, its heavy steps making noise on the damp earth. I barely had time to react when it launched itself against the front door with devastating force. The sound of the impact seemed to make my house tremble, and suddenly in a fraction of a second, the paw of that thing pierced the door and came dangerously close to me. I began to retreat, my heart pounding in my chest in pure terror, the wood of the door creaking and groaning as the werewolf continued its attack. I knew I couldn't stay still here, waiting for that beast to kill me at any moment. With panic seizing me, I ran towards the back door, my only hope of escaping the fury of that monster. Every beat of my heart echoed in my ears as I struggled to reach the safety outside. But before I could reach salvation, the front door gave way with a loud crash. The werewolf entered, its eyes fixed on me in a terrifying way, fear consuming me, my mind spinning in panic as I faced that terrible reality. In a last burst of adrenaline, I turned and ran out of the house. The darkness of the night was now like a sacred cloak. Every breath was an agonizing effort, every step a desperate struggle for survival. The forest stretched out before me like a dark maze. I started running aimlessly, driven by the simple desire to survive while I ran. The howls of the werewolf continued to echo through the forest, as if it was following me. Every time I looked back I expected to see it I was already expecting death. It was likely that I would escape unscathed from that terrible night. But one thing was certain, I wouldn't give up. I would try to escape until the end. I reached a point in the forest and climbed a tree where I remained until dawn. The next day I called the police. They saw the broken door, the footprints, but they couldn't do anything as they searched the surroundings and found no sign of any animal or person who could have done that. I spent several years of my life thinking that thing would come back, but it didn't. Like I said, nowadays the neighborhood is already inhabited and I believe that if it hasn't come back until now, it won't come back anymore. Now that there's no more forest for it to come or go from, good night. My name is Duar, and I will tell you about something that happened in my life, something I am sure I will never experience anything worse again. I found myself in a desperate situation on that dark dawn. My car had broken down on the deserted road not far from my farm. The cold seemed to penetrate my bones as I tried in vain to get the vehicle running again. It was the year 1994 and by that time my car was already quite old. 
Frustrated and worried about the passing time, I began to hear howls echoing through the darkness. A shiver ran down my spine when I realized those howls weren't far away. A sense of fear gripped me as I wondered what could be out there. That's when I saw, at the edge of my vision with the dim light of the headlights still on, a dark and monstrous figure moving. My eyes widened in horror as I realized that what was out there was a werewolf. My heart was pounding so hard I could hear it in my ears. I knew I needed to do something. I couldn't just sit there waiting to be devoured by that creature. With trembling hands, I opened the trunk and grabbed my axe that I always kept in the back seat for any kind of situation on the farm. I took a deep breath and made a decision. I wouldn't be an easy prey. I stepped out of the car with the axe firmly in my hands, ready to confront the werewolf and fight for my life. The creature began to stare at me, emitting a threatening growl. My legs were shaking, but I refused to back down and with a cry of defiance, I advanced towards the beast. The werewolf reacted with surprising speed, leaping towards me with sharp fangs. I raised the axe and struck cutting deeply into the flesh of that monster. It let out a howl of pain, momentarily retreating. Adrenaline rushed through my veins as I continued the fight, each swing of the axe delivered with fury and determination. The werewolf was not an easy opponent, but I was determined to survive. For what seemed like an eternity, we fought on that deserted road, illuminated only by the faint light of the moon and the car's headlights. Injured and exhausted, I finally managed to deliver a final blow that brought the creature down, causing it to transform into a bloody man. He was still alive but couldn't move anymore. He looked at me with a pleading expression but I wouldn't dare to help that man who, just a few seconds ago, was about to kill me in the form of that beast. It may sound crazy, but I got back into my car and started the engine. The car started as if nothing had happened, and I began to drive back to my farm, leaving that fallen man behind. The next day, I went to the town, returning by that same road. The man was no longer there. I even thought it might cause some trouble for me if that man lied and went to the police station saying that I had attacked him, but no complaint was made. At least the police didn't come after me and I never saw that man again. And to me, I believe he survived. Good night. It was a dark and silent night in the heart of a forest surrounding a town in the countryside. A group of friends decided to camp to enjoy the last weeks of summer. Excited, they set up their tents and lit a fire, enjoying each other's company. Under the starry sky, however, that lively atmosphere was brutally interrupted by screams of terror echoing through the forest. Other desperate campers ran towards the town, crying for help. Something horrible was lurking in the shadows, something that had torn apart the legs of one of their friends. The local firefighters, led by the experienced Captain Rodriguez, promptly responded to the emergency call. Equipped with lanterns, axes, and medical equipment, they ventured into the forest in the darkness, guided by the agitated campers. 
The trail led them to a clearing where the fire was still burning, revealing signs of a quick evacuation. In the center was one of the campers lying unconscious. The light of the lanterns revealed a scene of horror. His legs were torn apart by something that seemed to be sharp fangs. Captain Rodriguez and his team acted swiftly. While some firefighters provided first aid to the victim, others began to search for clues about the nature of the attack. Deep marks and large footprints were found around the clearing, making it clear that something terrible was in the vicinity. As the firefighters advanced through the forest, entering even denser and darker areas, a sense of discomfort settled among them. The distant roar of an unknown creature echoed through the trees, sending shivers down the spine of each team member. Following the clues, they found traces of blood and abandoned equipment. The campers, now safely in the town, reported seeing a hideous creature with bright eyes and sharp fangs emerging from the forest, brutally attacking them. An incessant search led the firefighters to a dark and sinister cave. The sense of imminent danger increased as they delved deeper. It was then that they spotted the creature. A grotesque and wild figure crouched over what seemed to be a recent prey. The creature, with bright eyes and sharp claws, stared at the firefighters with fury. They engaged in a tense confrontation, using their skills and equipment to drive the creature away, allowing them to escape from the cave back to the town. The victim was taken to the hospital, where doctors struggled to save his legs. The entire town was haunted by that experience, and the once peaceful forest now bore the weight of the presence of a creature that would remain in the region's urban legends for generations. Captain Rod Riggs and his team, despite successfully facing the threat, knew that the mystery of the nocturnal forest would remain an enigma that would withstand the test of time and human understanding. In a vast and lush forest, where gigantic trees reached towards the skies and various mysterious creatures inhabited its interior, at the heart of this impenetrable jungle, there was a desire to connect two distant cities through a railway. An audacious undertaking that would require courage, hard work, and a touch of fearlessness. The company responsible for this monumental task sent a team of workers to face the density of the forest, men and women, engineers and laborers, all united with a singular purpose, to forge a railroad that would forever change the connectivity of the region. The initial days of work were challenging, with axes cutting through the dense vegetation and thunderous machines creating clearings in the forest. Nights were filled with the sounds of nocturnal nature, but the workers were determined to achieve their goal. As the railway progressed, the forest seemed to react unexpectedly. Nighttime whispers fueled the workers' imagination. Some claimed to have heard strange voices, while others swore they had seen bright eyes in the darkness. However, 
These accounts were quickly dismissed as mere forest legends. On a night illuminated by the full moon, the team decided to camp in a recently cleared glade. As the moonlight bathed the area, nervousness enveloped the camp. Fires were lit, and stories were told to dispel the growing discomfort. It was then that something unimaginable happened. Suddenly, a roar echoed through the forest, prompting everyone to rise. The vegetation stirred, branches snapped, and the workers' eyes widened as a colossal creature emerged from the shadows. It was a creature whose form was a twisted blend of different forest animals, sharp claws, luminous eyes, and a roar that sent shivers down the workers' spines. The railway cut through the territory of this creature, and it was not pleased. Panic set in as the creature circled the camp. However, to everyone's surprise, instead of attacking, the creature communicated in a strange manner. It seemed to express sadness and anger, as if lamenting the human invasion of its territory. The creature hinted that it could kill everyone if it wanted to but chose not to, then withdrew. The initially terrified workers realized they needed a peaceful solution. They decided to work differently, promising to minimize environmental impact. This episode left a lasting mark on the workers, who learned to respect nature. Thus, the construction of the railway continued, but now with a new perspective and renewed respect. Weapons were brought to the camps around the construction, but they were not needed, as the creature did not reappear, and the railway was completed, connecting the cities and opening doors to development. Nevertheless, the legend of the nocturnal creature was always told as a reminder of the importance of preserving the delicate balance between man and nature. Hello, good night. First of all, I wanted to say that I'm a fan of your channel and everything I'm going to tell you here was real and everyone involved is still alive, so I won't let me lie. My name is Jose, better known as Junior. I was born in a paradise in the lower south of Bahia on an island called Tavare Island with the city of Cairo as its municipality, right where the famous hill of Sao Paulo is located. Good. That was about five years ago, when I, my partner Gretson, my partner Jachulio, and my cousin Gletson, who was my partner's brother and also cousin Gretson, we decided to go out for a hunt. It was a very beautiful night with a bright, full moon. We scheduled to leave at 7 p.m. and we did so. We walked for around an hour until one of the dogs picked up its scent and ran off into the woods. Then the other two also entered. We waited, insulating the dogs, and when they gave the signal that they had cornered the game, we entered the forest. When we got to the dogs, we didn't see anything. We looked and looked again and nothing. Until one of the dogs looked up the tree and started barking and growling. Gritson shined his flashlight on the tree trunk and saw nail marks. Soon he deduced that the hunt was a large antidote that was up in the tree. We turned on the other flashlights and there was the bad guy. We got him. We decided to continue forward and once again the dog came in and took another game. 
another one ahead. But this one was inside a large anthill, so we decided to set a trap and leave it to look another day. After about two hours of hunting, we arrived at a place that is already well known for having apparitions and other supernatural things. Then the dogs ran into the woods. But it seemed like they were being made stupid, for they entered and left. They entered again and left lost. It was then that Jachulio shouted, I already know what it is. This slut is playing with dogs. If she appears in front of me, I'll cut her up with my machete. Then, as soon as he closed his mouth, six dogs ran from one side of the forest to the other. So I said, guys, we only brought three dogs, didn't we? And they said, yes. I said, here it's been six. And then I got goosebumps. Then we started to hear voices and laughter. We saw a herd of cattle coming towards us and we ended up throwing ourselves into the bush. But the oxen suddenly disappeared. Gritson told us to stay together because we already knew what it was. And we knew that she wouldn't let us get out of that forest that easily. The moon shone in the sky and those lost in the woods. We saw a path and a person standing while Jachulio saw hunting. He put the dogs up and the thing that was looking at us rolled away into the woods. Less than a minute later the dogs screamed as if they were being hit by something. And it really was. Every breath of wind froze your spine. We heard loud voices laughing and the paths were covered in weeds in front of us. We didn't feel anything except weeds. Even with the moon lit and lanterns lit. All the time the dogs were crying, getting tangled up on our legs. We saw giant fireflies screaming and laughing that were scary. We heard branches breaking around us constantly. From time to time she tried to separate us, making each one see something different, different paths and even people calling. We knew we couldn't separate ourselves there because whoever she caught alone would get a hell of a beating, not to mention who knows what else could happen. We fell down ravines, crossed rivers, and mudflats. We were already exhausted, cold, and a little bruised due to the calluses on our boots. It was then that we remembered that we had brought garlic and some rope tobacco. We divided it between the four of us and each one left the garlic mixed with the rope smoke on the floor. And Jachulio threw another amount in the air and shouted take garlic and tobacco and leave us alone. Take garlic, I have more here. And he threw it up again. A strong wind passed us and broke everything inside the forest. And at the same time everything calmed down and when we looked we were on the sandy path which was the right way to go home. But I pointed the flashlight at the ground and there was our floorboard. We were walking in a circle all the time. We entered the forest and came out on the path and so on. So we went home around 4 o'clock in the morning. And when we got home I told my grandmother and she told me that we were lucky that we didn't get separated. I haven't hunted since then, but not out of fear. But also because I'm living in Rio de Janeiro now. I miss those adventures. The boys still hunt from time to time, but none of the four of us have forgotten that episode. Well. That was my somewhat summarized account of the day the caper didn't make me get lost in the woods. Sorry for the mistakes in Portuguese. All the names mentioned here are the real names of the people who were with me as well as mine. Thanks again and happy hunting.